Hello everyone. I'd like to begin this episode by saying that I made an error in the last episode, saying that there wasn't much Soviet nose artwork during the Soviet-Afghan war. Although Russian planes seldom had nose art, planes in combat areas did occasionally have nose art, as high command was often too far away and had much weaker jurisdiction, like the SG-17, which had artworks like Batman, this cute dragon dropping a bomb, or these animals holding both cameras and bombs, indicating that they were part of a reconnaissance squadron. This SU-17 has a rather simplistic set of jaws. It is also interesting to see what it looks like rusted and abandoned. This MiG-23 has an interesting artwork. It looks like a vulture holding an R-73 air-to-air missile with an F-16 in its crosshairs. We saw some artworks on the MiG-27s, like these jaws and this small red emblem. This Su-25 is a good example of why I like a lot of Russian nose artworks. They really experiment with styles and aren't afraid to try styles that are abstract. In the next episode, I am going to further examine Russian nose art. As with most Russian art, they have a rather interesting style that is often quite different to Western art. When the coalition moved into Afghanistan, we saw Nozart have a resurgence on CH-47 Chinooks. We did see a few pinups like Black Pearl, You Call We Hall, and Misbehaven. They are definitely more modestly dressed than some of the examples we saw in Vietnam. We also saw a lot of funny images like Combat Penguin, Green Goblin and Mmm Hookers, which is actually from Iraqi Freedom. This CH-47 artwork has an interesting story behind it. This heli had an APU generator come offline without warning. When the crew opened the right electrical pod, they discovered burnt wires and a very hot auxiliary power unit and generator control unit. After troubleshooting, it was found that the generator control unit was fried and the auxiliary power unit generator would not operate. The burnt wires were repaired and the GCU and APU generators were replaced. About two flights later, during a run-up, there was a fire in the number two power distribution panel and it all led back to the APU generator alternating current electrical system. Long story short, there was a bad ground that cooked the system not once, but twice. In the nose art, you can see an electric bolt getting ready to strike the GCU and fry it, with the GCU trying to stop it. It's rare that we get such a great story behind a nose artwork. On Canadian Chinooks, we saw a lot of nose artwork. When journalist Caitlin McWilliams reported on nose art in Afghanistan, five out of six helicopters were available to be photographed, and four out of the five had nose artworks, with the 5th heli having their artwork painted over, as it was considered unacceptable. Of course, how can you talk about nose art without mentioning the hog? The A-10 Warthog keeps the jaw motif alive. We did see some jaws in the last episode, with all the designs choosing to wrap underneath the aircraft. But the Warthogs of the 23rd Fighter Group go with a more traditional approach, putting the jaws at the front of the aircraft. Of course, the hog doesn't really need jaws to look menacing. The 30mm Gatling gun is more than menacing enough, but the jaws really do add a lot to the aircraft. It's hard to imagine the hog without a set of jaws. Squadrons like the 442nd Fighter Wing take a slightly different approach, putting a hog on their hog. I think it's a rather cool interpretation of the jaws that is both really creative and really menacing. The 188th Fighter Wing also put a hog on their hog, however, putting in much more detail. It's interesting seeing two different approaches to the hog on a hog concept. One is taking it more literally than the other. The 163rd Fighter Squadron, or the Black Snakes, put snakes on their planes. I wouldn't really associate the A-10 with a snake, but I like this artwork style and think it looks really incredible. I like how the scales fade out into the rest of the aircraft and how the tongue extends onto the gun sleeve. 
Personally, I like the 23rd Fighter Group's adaptation the most. It's a somewhat modern take on a classic, and for me, when I think of the Warthog, I think about it with this style of jaws adorned. I will say it can look a bit goofy from some angles. We saw a number of works on the F-15, pinups like Desert Princess and Cruel Intentions. It's interesting how we see many artworks feature bombs, like Nowhere to Hide, You Reap What You Sow, and the Kentucky Wampus Cat. Excuse me, what? We have seen mythical creatures before, but this one caught me off guard as I had never heard of it. Wikipedia defines it as, The Wampus Cat is a cat-like creature in American folklore that varies widely in appearance, ranging from frightful to comical, depending on the region. This one looks like it strays a bit too far into the comical side of things, to be honest. Anyway, we saw a lot of artworks on the KC-135 aerial refuelers. Again, we saw pinups like Southern Breeze, Swamp Witch, and Jersey Girl. We also saw the return of the Simpsons on aircraft, with this rather goofy looking Bart Simpson. The KC-135 is an incredibly popular platform for nose art. If I wanted to show all the KC-135 artworks I had found whilst researching nose art, this episode would be hours long. I think its popularity is driven by the fact that the KC-135 is such a large canvas for artists and pilots to express themselves, and the fact that the camouflage isn't exactly mission critical for such a large, vulnerable aircraft. The KC-135 is still required to be somewhat close to combat, so pilots still need the psychological boost that nose art provides. We saw many tributes to 9-11 on aircraft. We saw We Will Take It From Here on both this F-16 and this F-15. Also tributes to the New York Police Department, the New York Fire Department, and the Pentagon. It's a testament to how harrowing 9-11 was for many Americans. Yet again, this era proved to be difficult to find information for. Nose art work policy in wartime was the same as the Gulf War, where for nose art to be permanent, the crew would have to receive permission from high command, who must deem it not to be too offensive. When aircraft returned back to America, nose art work was removed. I wouldn't say this is my favorite era, to be honest, as there wasn't many large and striking artworks like World War II or Vietnam but I still find it interesting seeing how different air crews cope with the stresses of war. Some choose to go with a more aggressive route, choosing images with skulls and death. Some go with the more traditional hometown gal and pinup. And others just have little images to personalize their aircraft. Any little psychological boost helps when death is a very real possibility every day. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Next episode I finally get to gush about my favourite artworks and get to display some incredible nose artworks. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it, and I'll see you next time.